I was featured in the N1 Vix Tape Tour video game, which was uh, 2006 as well. So in the year 2006, I was in Raw vs. SmackDown video game, and I was in the N1 Vix Tape Tour basketball video game. So two-sport video game athlete, 2006. Man, how many people can say that? Bo Jackson can say it. Deion Sanders can say it. Uh, Brian Jordan can say it. Brock Lesnar can say it. And Mark Jindrak. There we go, dude. Oh, That's fine. exclusive right there. What's up, guys? Welcome into another episode of the Cutting Up Podcast. Today we have my friend, former WWE star, WCW star. What was the one in Mexico? Uh, CMLL. CMLL. My friend, Mark Jindrak, a.k.a. some of you may know him as Marco Corleone. How are we doing today, my man? Pretty good, man. Doing good? Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started here. Let's, right. uh, let's do this haircut. What do, uh, what do we want to do today? Uh, I want to get a half on the side, a fade, but basically yep. a half on the side. Yep. Uh, Kind of high on top, just uh, keep some hair on top. Maybe spike it up in the front. Or yeah, maybe? spike it up in the front. But like, if you could take maybe just a little, a few weeks off, maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Perfect. We can do that, my man. Simplistic. I wear a hat most of the time, anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. So. Awesome. I keep it. will be fresh for uh, two days before I put in the hat for the next two weeks. Perfect. So we were talking here a little bit beforehand about where wrestling is today and we're going to go through your whole journey but i did want to ask you since we were just talking about it uh in your opinion what's the golden age of wrestling are we currently in it or does it go back to the i know a lot of people talk about and i'm not i didn't you know before we get this whole episode started i wasn't growing up just dialed into everything wwe and all those things i know about it and obviously it's very relevant um but not super in-depth analysis going to come from me today but i know late 80s was when it first kind of took off right that's kind of when wrestlemania was birthed then you have the late 90s which i think is what they call like the attitude era. Attitude, era. attitude era so yeah. so what to you in your opinion you may be a little biased because you might have been in one of those eras but uh what's the golden age of wrestling uh, you know I, my era was ruthless aggression era okay and that was like the birth of like john cena uh randy orton um but I think the Attitude Era was probably the, the coolest. And then during the Attitude Era, I was with the other company, WCW. Okay. And we at WCW, at one point in time, were beating WWE in the ratings. We always had that Monday Night War. It was Monday Night Raw versus Monday Night Nitro. Nitro and WCW, Raw was um, WWE. And every night, uh, every Monday night, there'd be a competition based on the ratings. And, and WCW won for like, 83 weeks in a row or something like that. Jeez. Uh, because all the old WWF stars jumped over to WCW and Ted Turner owned w WCW and he started going and getting stars like Kevin Nash, Scott Hall. And then when that was happening, when they took over in the ratings war, WWE was, was grooming stars like The Rock, Stone Cold. Uh, it was the birth of like Kurt Angle. Um, and that kind of like took over. So that that was the Attitude Era, Stone Cold Era. I, th I think for me, that was the that was the gold move. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. The, you know, the traditionalists, the traditionalists will say, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan and one of the, you know, first WrestleManias. But uh, for me, it's the Attitude Era with that. The Rock, the birth of the Rock, birth of Stone Cold. So Attitude Era, that's my final answer. There we go. So, so what happened to the WCW? Did it fall apart while you were yeah, in there? Yeah, or? yeah exactly when it fell apart. Um, and that was kind of like the reason um, we got thrown on TV fairly quickly in WCW. I, I trained at a place called the Power Flat, and that was in Atlanta, Georgia. And basically, that groomed you to get on TV. Um, so basically, myself and a lot of the guys I got into this business with, uh, we kind of got all quick, quickly thrown in the mix because. Uh, you know, they were slipping. And that, like I just said, like, while we were winning in the ratings, that's when we were getting to school, basically, and it's schooling. So when WWE came back with a vengeance and kind of like took over again with the, all those young guys like the Hardy Boys and The Rock and the Stone Cold era, they had to try, WCW had to try an answer. And, and that's basically why all the young guys got a chance early on. So, so basically when WCW shut down and, um, WWE bought us. Um, I was like one of the first ten people to get signed over with WWE. So, so the TV time we got in WCW was just enough to get noticed, 
in WWE, basically. Wow. So let's talk about your journey and how you got into all of this. Growing up, were you a big fan I was. Of, of wrestling? Who, who did you? Uh, the Hulkster, man. Who, who was your favorite? The Hulkster, Hulk Hogan, man. Okay, yep. Uh, the, the, the monument, like during that time, there was monumental like uh, characters. It was all character based. It was larger than life, like like Hibbilly Jim and Hulk Hogan and Big John Studd, Andre the Giant, uh, Bruce the Barber Beefcake, Jake the Snake, you know, so all these characters were like larger than life characters. And that's when I was kind of growing up into it during that mid eighties, say. So with the mid eighties, it was, Nat, if you, if you were into wrestling, you were pretty much into Hulk Hogan, you know? And yeah, uh, his nemesis actually died just recently, a few days ago on the Iron Sheik. So uh, I poured a little liquor for Iron Sheik later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was just the eighties, mid eighties, I, you know, watched it and like a lot of things, when I turned it, you know, or teenage years, I kind of put down the collecting baseball cards and watching wrestling. When girls came around, yeah, you know, in, in puberty, <laughs> we put the wrestling and baseball cards down. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, the wrestling, it, it's just, for me, it was like pop culture in America, you know. Uh, it, arguably in the late 80s, probably one of the most recognizable people in the United States was Hulk Hogan. Yeah. So, it was, so it's, it's Pretty unique. I never thought, I never dreamed I'd be a wrestler. I always dreamed I'd be a, another type of athlete, like a baseball or basketball player or something. And end up being man wrestling, so. You got the size for it. Now you played, I believe we talked about it, you played college basketball? I played, yeah, I played, I played, uh, I played high school. I was a, a pretty good high school player. Um, but I went to a division three uh, college, so. Oh. For, for you guys at home that don't really know, like there's division one, like the Duke in North Carolina, there's division two that's just level step below, and then I was division three. It's very competitive and still a lot of, get a lot of great players. There's been two or three or four players in the history of like division three that went to the NBA. So it's not impossible, but uh, you know, I, that's what I did. I, pl I played college basketball. So that's, that's kind of like the reason why I got into wrestling. You know, I was a very athletic kid. Um, I'm six foot six. You know, so I, I just had to do something athletic, you know, and I may, I may have felt a little short, uh, no pun intended, you know, I wish I was six foot 10 or six foot 11 to play basketball, but. Um, you had a vertical that was insane. I, I did. know, and, and kind of looking into a little bit more of your backstory that you were famous for your drop kick and having, what was your vertical back then? My vertical, the, the, it's on record for like 42 inches, you know, so. At six, six, that's six, insane. Six, six, 42 inches, I mean, like, I, I you know, it's rumor has it Jordan's vertical is 48 inches. So, uh, <laughs> but the difference between, you know, Jordan was 210 pounds, uh, 205 pounds. Uh, I, uh, I weighed like 255 when I was jumping. So, so SEO. um, but you know, jumping was, a, it was actually in my, I guess, genetics, I guess, because, uh, you know, my, not my dad, but my dad's dad, my grandfather, he was, a, a great high jumper in his days. Uh, like world class kind of, well not world class, but maybe scholastically good in America, you know? Yeah. So uh, he used to, that's when they didn't even have uh, mats. Yeah, they used to do like a scissor kick over the high jump bar and land in like a pit of like sawdust or whatever. So I guess he, he jumped pretty high without the, you know, the padding and stuff. So I guess that's where I get it from jumping. But uh, yeah, like 40, 40 plus things very cool. So how, how did you actually get into wrestling? When did it change? You went to college for I basketball. Went to college for basketball. Graduate and then was that just the next step or did you do something in between? How did you get introduced to, well, to actually becoming a wrestler? All right, I, well, I told you, this is a great story. I, I told you about how, you know, I watched it as a kid and then I put it down for a yeah. while. And then, um, so fast forward, I played my freshman and sophomore year at at uh, my division three school. It's called Kiyuka, Kiyuka. And uh, so I was about to enter my junior year and some of the seniors that graduated, they were going to move down to Orlando to start their careers in mm -hmm. food service. So they're like, hey, Mark, why don't you come down? We're, you know, we went to schools upstate New York. Uh, he said, why don't you come down to Orlando for the uh, summer? Just kind of hang out when, you know, when drive the U-Haul truck for us, do us a, a solid, and we'll drive our cars. And then at the end of the summer, just go back up and go back to your school, you know, back to school. And I was like, yeah, sounds good. So that's what I did. I went down to Orlando. I got a job working nights. So I wanted to hang out on the weekends. So I think the graveyard shift 
at a local Denny's, like literally within walking distance from my apartment complex. And um, man, one night at like 11 at, 11 at night, two guys came in and they're both wrestlers for WCW. And they used to film in Orlando down at Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. So I was cool with them. They're, I guess they had just got done uh, filming at Universal Studios. So they, uh, I, was, I was talking with one and the other guy was just kind of into himself. Um, the guy asked me specifically, you know, do you, do you like wrestling? Would you ever get into wrestling? I was like, nah, I watched him when I was a kid, but you know, I'm a basketball player and blah, blah, blah. And so they left that night. And I remember later that night, it was like three in the morning. Uh, it's just me, the, the chef and the dishwasher. And basically, uh, two kids come in, I don't say young, young adults, I guess. And they said, do you have four quarters for a dollar? Yeah, sure. I so I opened the register. When I look up, a gun was pointed at my head. Oh. And another guy had a pipe. And uh, they're like, give me all the money. And so I gave them all the money and stuff. And uh, they left. And automatically being young and stupid, I was like, man, that was pretty cool. I got held up. Was, yeah. Hell yeah. Not scared at all. So basically, I did the police report. Um, and, you know, they let me go in the morning, obviously. Uh, I was like probably 5, 5.30 in the morning. So instead of waking my, my friend up to tell him about it, like, yeah, I didn't get held up. Um, he, you know, he has 12 hour days work days, so I'm not going to wake him up and be it. I said, you know what? I'm just going to go down to the little community pool in our apartment complex. I'm going to go hang out there for an hour, go in the jacuzzi or something, we'll off some steam. And then when he wakes up, I'll breakfast with him and tell him all about it. Well, I went down in the pool. One of the wrestlers that I met at the, the no Denny's way. was there. He was no dating way. a girl in my complex. And, no he, and now he's in the pool. It's like 5.30 in the morning. He's in the pool with her getting all rowdy and they've had some drinks. And uh, man, I, I told him about what just happened. You know, I got held up and stuff. And he's like, man, it's... and now I have my shirt off, you know? So now you can uh, see that I have a little more like- 6'6", six, 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 no shirt And you know, tell me before, you know, when I got my Denny's uniform on, he's like, you're a pretty big guy, you know? Are you, <laughs> are you athletic? And I was like, yeah, I'm athletic, you know? But a lot of people say they're athletic and they're not athletic. I was, I was really athletic. And, um, you know, now he sees my shirt off. He's like, you got a pretty good build. Like, man, you know, Dealing with what happened tonight, you have to see that sometimes nothing's guaranteed in life. And he's like, you sure you don't want to try out and be a wrestler? And he goes, I'll tell you what, if you try out in Atlanta, I'll pay for it. It was a $300 tryout. Wow. And uh, man, just some, I, w I actually went and tried out. And, and lo and behold, actually the next day, he was like, hey, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh, actually today or next, later in the day. And I was like, I just got to wake up and do this uh, little composite drawing with the police detective. Mm -hmm. But after that, nothing. He's like, come down with me to Universe Studios. I'll, sh I'll introduce you to some of the guys. And I'll introduce you to the trainer who's going to be at that training school in Atlanta that will give you the tryout. I said, yeah, man, cool. So I went down to Universe Studios. And like I just told you earlier, Ted Turner was buying all these stars up from, WC from WWE. And that's what I watched as a kid. So when I went backstage that day at WCW, I met Hogan. I met Kevin Nash, I met Scott Hall, I met like Virgil, Million Dollar Man, Rick Rude, Mr. Mr. Perfect Kerr Heading. And these are all those classic names in the 80s. Now they're all signed with WCW and mm -hmm. Turner. And uh, it just blew my mind, man. It brought me back to when I was a kid. Now I'm, now I'm an adult, young adult, and I legitimately have a chance to try out and make it to be one of these guys, you know? Wow. And the, the cherry on the, I guess on the, Sunday was when I was walking out of Universe Studios as Mercedes pulled up and he rolled down his window and it was the macho man. He was like, okay. He was like, man, I thought you were somebody else. Sorry. And that just, that was it, man. I went and tried out and uh, I made it. That's a whole different story, but that's how I got into wrestling. Wow. And so you started with WCW. So with WCW, it was a, that tryout, it was at a, a, tr a school called the Power Plant place that was like notably like impossible to pass like in my tryout 30 30 guys 27 guys were on my tryout and by day two it was like me and two others it was they they physically tortured you really? push-ups sit-ups running push-ups sit-ups running like to, to exhaustion because that was more of the tryout because you can get guys that were physically capable and physically look good but they weren't really athletic as athletic per se you know and mm -hmm. and what we do in wrestling is uh, you got to be athletic you can't just be a big 
being goofy, like, you know, muscle head, because you're, you're literally can break somebody's neck. You know, what we do is not, not, you know, people will say it's fake. It's not fake. We're taking all the yeah. we're landing. We're taking all the blows and all the, all the physical punishment. Just, we have to get it right. And that's when, you know, you want to deal with people that are more athletic. So. Definitely. So how long are you in the WCW before it disbands and then you go over to WWE? Um, WCW, we all got, we, me and all, most of the guys I trained with, we all got signed um, out of the power plant with WCW on April 7th, 1999. So I basically trained for a little less than a year, got a contract. Um, and basically we got, we kind of all got thrown on TV around late 99, early 2000. Um, and basically in, uh, the company shut down in March of 2001. Okay. So we basically got eight, eight to nine months of television. But what, it was good television because, uh, you know, my, my partner and I, uh, myself and Sean O'Hare, we were, we had a group called the National Born Thrillers and we were actually tag team champions. Um, like in the year 2000, we were out for like rookies in the year. We came in second place behind the Hardy Boys, uh, you know, so. Yeah. So we had a lot of promise at a, an early age, you know, we just yep. were really, really green because we kind of got thrown into the mix really quick. And in wrestling, like I said, it's, it's, it's a lot of theatrics. You got to be athletic and built and, and be able to sustain punishment. But uh, you also need experience, you know, sometimes it's, you know, like we're on TV, we're on camera right now, you know, when that red light comes on, sometimes it changes for people. It, it, it's more nerve wracking, uh, you know, like there's no mistakes. And like people think just because it's like, you know, predetermined and they want to call it fake. Like there's no, there's no, like in the movies, yeah. when Tom Cruise is doing all these stunts, they, they can be take five, take six, take seven. They're, yeah. In our business, there's only one take yep. and, and there's some, Sometimes there's some really gruesome injuries and, and a lot of bad things can happen. You know, uh, people have died in the ring before and, uh, you know, so it's something that we always have to be physically ready and capable and always in tip top sh uh, shape, you know? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So you go over to WWE and how long are you there? I was there between 2001 and 2005. So about four years, uh, in that four years that I've, I participated in a lot of um, pay-per-views. Uh, Some big matchups, right? Big matches. Uh, I saw Rey Mysterio. You, you had one with Rey Mysterio. I came up short in that one, but that's one of my favorite matches. You know? That's fun. And, I watched a little bit of it. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, and wrestling, that's the great thing about wrestling. Because it's predetermined, win or lose, you can, you can shine either way. You know? Yeah. It's all about the match. You put on a good match, you know, to share a ring with a, uh, somebody like Rey Mysterio, and he was considered one of the top 10 of all time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a feather in my cap. It's something I can always cherish. Like, you know, just the other day at work, I was showing my buddies, you know, at, at uh, that video. And it's just, it's cool to look back. Uh, it feels like eons ago, but, uh, you know, it's something I can I can go back and look at from time to time. Biggest win? Biggest win, uh, probably Eddie Guerrero or Ric Flair. Okay. Uh, Ric Flair was a tag team match with myself. Uh, and my partner would be... I want to say Randy Orton and Ric Flair. Um, in singles competition, I beat uh, Eddie Guerrero in singles nice. competition. So those two, those two probably, and probably, you know, winning the tag team championships uh, in WCW, uh, that was a victory over Rey Mysterio and his partner, Juventud Guerrero. So a couple of big victories in my career. Now, when you Google your name, uh, one of the first things that pops up, biggest storylines, is evolution, right? Yeah. Is that what it's yeah. called? Yeah. Talk about talk about that and what happened there. Uh, Evolution that was arguably one of the greatest duo or uh, four man four man yeah. four man duo and duos too. <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the best groups of all time, considerably. You know, like maybe they're up there with the greats, like the Four Horsemen. So Evolution, you know, the group consisted of uh, Triple H, Batista, Orton, and uh, Randy Orton, and. What people don't know, some people don't know until they did a little documentary on it, was I was orig originally the fourth member. It was myself, Orton, Blair, and Triple H. Uh, and for immaturity, for goofing off, having too much fun, me and Orton, uh, I kind of like, uh, I got kicked out of the group. 
before yeah. the group actually actually so i filmed a lot of stuff i was slated to be the next member but like it just I don't know. Just thought, they they took me out at the last minute, and the, so that was kind of like uh, that's like my uh, own Gary uh, Wally Pip story. That was like Wally Pip was a guy who played first baseman for the Yankees, and he had a headache one day, and so he sat out, and Joe DiMaggio took over at first base, and or Lou Gehrig. I'm not, I can't remember which one, but uh, played like two thousand one hundred consecutive games, and <laughs> the guy never got his chance again. So, yeah. uh, so basically, I was. Just to be in the group, but I was taken out last minute. And uh, so. did you handle that pretty well at the time? At the time, yeah. I mean, at the time, I think I was probably like 24, 25 years old. I mean, in my mind, I mean, like, I just, first of all, I never thought w, WWE, like, athletically, I was very superior. But these guys, these wrestlers, a lot of great athletes have been coming through. Like, Kurt Angle was an Olympic gold medalist. And, um, but for the majority, you know, like I, I come from a background with, you know, some some world class athleticism, you know. So I never thought in a million years that I always thought I was going to make it, and you know, never, never not have a job in WWE. But like, uh, you know, so I, I just, I, I, I honestly feel like I fell short a little bit of what I was capable of in WWE. Uh, and I, and they eventually released me in 2005. So, um, but See, that, that was the end of one chapter, but beginning another great. Yes, chapter. exactly. And I want to talk about that because I think that is the the coolest part and the most interesting part about your journey is you talked about the the pictures and the analogy there of you know the one guy goes on to be great and then the other guy just disappears. Yeah, you didn't do that. You could have. Yeah, you easily could have left WWE, went on to do something, and and never, you know, most people would just forget about it and move on, and yeah. you know, it would have been the same story, you know, almost there. That would have been my big break, but it didn't work out. But you didn't, you didn't stop, you didn't give up, yeah. you went a different path and became more successful than you were in the WWE. Now you were in a different part of the world. Yeah, you were down in Mexico, but you became a superstar down there and led to so many more things, even, I believe, meeting your wife, right? Is that where you, oh, met, yeah. you met her down there? Yeah. So, so many different things in your career changed when what looked like the end yeah. and the bottom of the, the hill there, mm -hmm. but you were just in a slight valley and you were you were headed back up the mountaintop. So I wanna talk about that. A, obviously, you know, let's talk about your journey in, into Mexico and into that world down there, but then also like, you know, how did you pick yourself up? How did you get over that where most people would be embarrassed or most people would just say, you know, they'd just be completely defeated. You turn that into something else. So how'd you do that? Um, yeah, it was tough. It was tough. It was a, it was a shot to my ego because in July, July 5th of two, 2005, they released me. Um, I remember the phone call exactly. They released me from my contract and, uh, I got caught up in a release of like 27 people. So, you know, the, my career was wrestling and now I'm, I'm in America making, I was making good money. And now I'm basically making nothing, you know? So as a wrestler, what do you do? You know, so I tried out Japan, I tried out Mexico and Mexico was the obvious choice for, for language, uh, distance. I just, I felt a vibe there, you know, Mexico city was a, a great city. So I went there in 2006 and man, I can tell you like instantly I had success, you know, um, and this is the birth of Marco Corleone. Marco right? Corleone. Marco Corleone. Do you do that yourself? Or? I don't know. They they they, they, they brought me in as they they needed um, a basically a character. They wanted a character like an Italian type character. Okay. And Mark Jindrak is really not an Italian name. So <laughs> so I, I you know and, and coming in like they just made they made that name up Marco Corleone. They, they had Mark and made Marco and then they just thought of some. You know, I think Corleone, the, you know, the godfather, Corleone. So yeah. Marco Corleone was born. And uh, in 2006, man, I, I went there. I was going there for weeks, three weeks, four weeks at a time. And then uh, basically just coming back home to America. And then, but then I thought to myself, like, man, this is like, I see a real potential to be able to ca catch on with the Mexican fans. And sure enough, I decided to stay. So in early 2007, I, I just decided, I stayed in Mexico. I lived there permanently. And uh, to be honest, man, like I to sum it up, I I became an overnight star. I mean, I learned Spanish. I started getting big TV gigs. Um, I started getting mainstream like uh, mainstream like uh, headlines. 
I saw you had some acting credits. Is that true? Acting credits, yeah. I was in like I was in the number one um, TV show in about 2010 in Mexico for like six months, and I, I had a really big part. Um, I had like a catchphrase. Uh, it was the, the, the they called novellas. Yeah, yeah. They're high. Oh, trust me, my yeah. grandma watches the yeah. novellas. We know about that. So I, I was in this one novella called Porcela Mormanda. So you so probably got, watched it. Yeah, so I got I got popular in wrestling, and I, that's where then people would know me. But like. Then I started, I crossed over and started doing the, the, this part. And so, um, it was, and it was super high rated, like literally like half of Mexico was seeing me every night. Like this, this, this novella was so high rated. And um, I had a catchphrase that was, I said, or Picadillo. And, and that catchphrase was so like catchy to the public, general mm -hmm. public. It caught on almost like Arnold Schwarzenegger did here in, in the nineties, like I'll be back. Yeah, hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> that peculiar accent translated for me in Spanish. It was a peculiar accent, and and uh, but it caught on, and uh, it was crazy. A lot of nights when I had some big parts, that phrase would like trend on Twitter in Mexico, <laughs> you know, because it, yeah, uh, it was just a funny, peculiar, and so basically, um, can you say what it means or no? The Buenos Picadillo means I'm going to make chop media. Okay. It's kind of like an old school saying, like if I, like if I was, if you heard some foreigner like with an accent, basically threatening you, hey boy, I'm gonna make chop media. Yeah. It, it, it would, and then you add a weird accent to it, it'll probably catch on here in the United States in the movie, you know? <laughs> that that was kind of like what caught on it. And it was, and after that, man, it was, it was crazy. So because of that saying, because of that catchphrase, um, I started getting a lot of TV gigs where I'd say that, like people just wanted to hear it. Yeah. So like it was unheard of. It was like the next novella I did, I, I finished that novella, it ended. And then the next novella I did, I got brought back as a character, but as a, but as a good guy now. So I was a bad guy in the first novella. And the next novella, I was a good guy. And I still said the same thing, table master, pink video. <laughs> so it'd be like, a, Arnold Schwarzenegger kept saying, I'll be back in yeah, every single role. movie he did. Yeah. <laughs> so that was basically me and they, they just loved it. So That's hilarious. they ain't broke, don't fix it. But uh, no yeah, kidding. I had a... Um, you didn't trademark it? No. It was, <laughs> I, I didn't. Um, but what was crazy is um, after that, it was just like the rest is history. Like I, I, I had my old cologne in Mexico for a while called Strong Mind. Uh, I wrote a children's book in Mexico. Really? Uh, called, uh, it, was a, it, was a group about, it was a book about bullying, basically. Uh -huh. you know, bullying became a big topic in the, um, basically a big topic in, in Mexico and all the world in the you know, early 2000s and stuff. So I, I wrote a book about that. Uh, I, uh, like I said, I did a lot of roles in novellas. Uh, and then uh, we can't forget about the wrestling. You know, the wrestling, I became trios champion in, in my a company, CMLL. And CMLL was like, it's the oldest company in all of the world in wrestling, you know. So it was like 90 years old, uh, you know. So I was a champion there. Uh, so basically Mexico for me, I mean, even even this is a fun fact, in, in Mexico, uh, I have a, I met my wife and we had a child. He was born in Mexico and the Nacho Libre, the guy that Jack Black portrayed in, in that movie, uh, Nacho Libre. Yeah. <laughs> he baptized my son. Really? Not Jack Black, but the guy that Jack Black portrayed. I didn't even know that was based on a yeah, true, true story. story. Yeah. So there was a priest, there was a priest, uh, called Frey Tomrenta that by back in the day by, he, he worked with the, you know, there was an orphanage in the church. They didn't have a lot of money, so by day he would do his priestly duties uh, and run the orphanage, and by night he'd go and put a mask on and wrestle, make money to help the orphans. And he baptized your son. And you know, so after that movie, National Libre came out. This guy, Frey, Frey Tormenta, is his name. He became like a cult, cultural icon in Mexico, you know, yeah. obviously because the movie became, was so popular. Yeah. And uh, he baptized my son uh, with his mask on. So <laughs> in a church, I was over five hundred. 500 years old. That is awesome. In Mexico. So. That is awesome, dude. So, you know, it was a wild ride, man. And, and like you said, like, you know, WWE, obviously, is the most famous company in the world in terms of wrestling. But uh, 
you know, like I learned that sometimes in, in life, it always doesn't have to be an easy five plus five and get the 10 in life mm -hmm. success. You know, it can be eight plus two, it can be seven plus three. That's good. And um, that's what I kind of learned, you know, and, and apart from just making this leap into a, you know, another culture, another language, another, it, it you know, it, I think sometimes we as Americans, you know, like need to get out more and see the other parts of the world because it opened my mind to so many things, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, I, if you watch some movies and stuff or you, you think Mexico is just sometimes like, just like a uh, ghost town with like, you know, like you watch it and when people cross the border, it automatically becomes like, you know, like desert. It's not like that. Like, yeah, I, it's like desert and cartel, right? That's I, all. Yeah. Thing. I wake up like in the morning and, you know, cross the street and there's a Starbucks there and there's, you know, there's regular, you know, so like, yeah. Uh, you know, so I guess it educated me more from a, a standpoint. So I mean, Mexico for me was probably the best decision I ever made in life. Um, from a family standpoint, I met my wife there, and obviously we had a child. From a career standpoint, uh, like you said, I, I could have ended my WWE career on a down on a down yeah. slope, you know. But you know, I, I did this whole lucha libre experience and created a whole new life for myself. Acted, wrote books, uh, you know. Yeah my own cologne like so like the, those things cool, man. those things you can never you know you I, i'm even in the mall i was in a, a pl place called plaza of the stars in, the, in a mall in mexico city and i have my hands engraved in the floor so yeah and those things, awesome, those things that that's so important man because i think it's just you know it's not like you can't be too stubborn you I mean, you have dreams you have goals things you want to accomplish but you have to be willing to be flexible and you have Absolutely. to be willing because like you said what you may think that you want it may not come in the same route that you want it to come in yep. you know what i mean you can still get to that point going a different direction. And yep. so I think that's so important for people is that a lot of people, they do, they try to start their own business or they try to pursue a hobby or they try to, you know, do whatever it is that they're passionate about, but then it doesn't, you know, they don't reach that success right away or they they hit a failure, they hit a block, they hit a wall and they give up and they walk away and say, oh, it didn't work. You know what I mean? And yep. sometimes it's like, well, it didn't work that way, but maybe there's another way you can make it work and keep going and persevering because you can be even bigger than you thought you could be going a different direction and that's so cool and that's why i love your stories because you didn't give up you know what i mean you could have yeah. and you could have you could have went your whole life talking about just the little thing you had in wwe and you can always say oh i almost did this but almost, yeah. instead you're like you know what i can do this let me try a different direction and even more popular than you could have been here you know what i'm saying and yeah. so that's really cool one of the things i think is probably the coolest thing about you um and you told me this is that you were in two video games in the same exact year tell us about that well, I told yeah, I told you I got released in w, WWE uh, July fifth, two thousand and five. Um, so I already, even though I got released, I still made the cut for the video game from two thousand and six video game Raw was a SmackDown, and um, so yeah, so I, so I was in a wrestling video game, which is normal because I was a wrestler. Yeah. Yep. But when I got released from my contract in July fifth, uh, because I played basketball before and because I had that crazy uh, vertical leap. Um, there used to be a show, the N1 Mixtape Tour, and it'd be on ESPN, and that was basically like a brand, it was like a new school, Harlem Globetrotters. And the tryouts, when they come to every city and try out, and basically what the deal was, like for example, in Atlanta, they'd come and they set up like multiple courts outside, and everyone would just run, you know, shirts and skins. We'd play, and like the, the players that were on the TV show, the characters, uh, they would watch, and if you did something special, you got in the building. They only took three to go in the building, and that's where the, in the building is where they filmed the show for ESPN and 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 that. So, so basically, this tryout in Atlanta, I went there on a really really hot July afternoon outside, and um, basically uh, tried out, and I was one of the three that got in in the building. So I tried out, uh, made it, and they had one mixtape tour, played. Won the slam dunk contest, and uh, later that year, uh, I was featured in the N1 mixtape tour video game, which was uh, 2006 as well. So in the year 2006, I was in Raw versus SmackDown video game, and I was in the N1 mixtape tour basketball video game. So two sport video game athlete, 2006. Man, how many people can say that? Bo Jackson can say it. Deion Sanders can say it. Uh, Brian Jordan can say it. Brock Lesnar can say it. And Mark Jindrak. There we go, dude. Oh, that's exclusive five. right there. Exclusive. Man. On the Mount Rush War, two, two sport athlete video game. That's yeah. awesome, man. Do you own them both? 
I do have them. I have a lot. You have to, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, dude. I would, I would carry them with me everywhere, I think. Like, they'd be in my back pocket at all times. Yeah, and then uh, um, I have the screenshots in the video. You know, like, uh, they they called my character on... The one thing I hate on the animal mixed name tour of a new game, my character uh, had me at six foot four, which is okay. I'm six six, but six four works. But they had me at 185 pounds. I was two hundred. Oh, I was two fifty five when I played that. You know, so they they shorted me seventy pounds of muscle. She. Uh, but did they give you the define? You know what I mean? Like, they didn't give me some definition. Did you have your shirt on in the video game or no? Yeah. Yeah. Surprised. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So. Uh, that was kind of cool, you know. So I uh, made a video game and two video games. That's awesome, man. So yeah. So tell us uh, favorite moments. Um, it can be WCW, WWE, your time in Mexico. Favorite match, favorite moment uh, during your career. Okay, favorite match. Uh, like the, you know the the match you talked about. My favorite match. It was just a, a normal SmackDown match in San Jose, and it was against Rey Mysterio who's actually a good friend of mine as well. Uh, I did not win that match. It's crazy because I could could have selected a match where I won a championship or something, but I, mm -hmm. I selected a match where it was just a really, really good match. The crowd was really into it. It was a good back and forth. So favorite match, probably with Rey Mysterio, and that was on SmackDown in 2005. Um, favorite memory moments? Uh, to be honest, like my moments you'd think would come from like, wrestling in my career but like my favorite moments moments were they're always based out of something that came from wrestling uh like the acting that was a very favorite moment and being in a real successful number one hit tv show in mexico um the two sport the two video game athlete thing I, I, that was those are great moments another thing i heard you talking about golf earlier here's a fun story you'd like okay the first time i ever went golfing the first yep. time i ever went golfing hole number four Hole in one. No way. Yes. Yes. Like literally, like it was crazy because that was um that moment like was crazy because my my first wife I was uh with uh her grandmother died and her grandmother lived in Greenville, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. So the whole family came up there. We came up obviously and uh we spent a couple days with uh you know, the grandfather was still alive, you know, so it was tough for him. So it was like almost like a two or three day thing where we just celebrated her life, helped him get ready with the funeral and all those things, make arrangements. Mm -hmm. So during the day we'd have activities and her dad came, my ex-wife's dad came and he was an avid golfer and he had two sons. So they, they wanted to go golfing one day in the afternoon. They said, hey Mark, you wanna come along? And I was like, man, I've, I've never been golfing before. <laughs> I've been to mini putt putt and I've been to driving ranges, yep. you know, but I've never played official golf. And uh, he's like, come on, come along. And so that was the day. And on the way, I was like, man, like, what if, you know, sometimes you never know how good you are at something. They're like, okay, I had a crazy vertical and I was good at basketball and I was a good wrestler. What, I never tried playing golf. What if I was a natural golfer or something? I just never tapped into it. Yeah. I said, what if I get a hole in one and stuff today? And, and my ex-father-in-law was like, I have never got yeah, a hole in one in 26 years. Yeah. And I was like, so three holes went by. No, I can say it was only a par three course, okay? But it was 100, 177 yards out. Still, yeah. And uh, fourth hole, and man, I, I hit it, and it should have hit the green and bounced way past the hole. But what it did was like, from what I could tell, is from the distance, I, it was like a perfect online drive, okay? Mm -hmm. And it like hit the green, and then the ball kind of like just disappeared, and did like weird like, it was like it floated and just it disappeared. Yeah. And I was like, where'd it go? I thought it just hit and went in the bushes and stuff off the green because I hit it hard. Yeah. And all of a sudden I looked to the left and the guys on the adjacent hole who were playing like ahead of us started jumping up and down. It went in, it went in. So I ran down there and uh, they told me what had happened was it hit hard, it hit the, hit the uh, pin, the pole. Yeah. And it did like a weird spin and just dropped in. Wow. Like, and just in the cup and uh i ran they, they got my picture in the newspaper and uh i saved the card i'm obviously the scorecard from that day but yeah, yeah. first time to ever golfing for hole number four i got a hole in one that's sick all right mark wrapping up here let's uh let's check out this haircut make sure it looks good and then all right we'll get you on your way here oh, yeah that's perfect what do you think my man for shorting it for you on the side there perfect
That'll work. Yeah. Top of the good length. Very good, man. Mark, I appreciate you coming on here, man. Uh, your clips are all over. I think if they just YouTube, Google your, your name, it'll yeah. all pop up. It'll pop up. Everything you want to find out about me. It's all good, bad, good, bad. Different. <laughs> and if they were, let's say they want to watch one one match, you say go watch Ray Mysterio. That's the best one. Yeah, if you type in my name, Mark Jindrak, a, a ton of matches will come up in WWE. There's a lot of good ones of where I win and lose. Uh, and then also Marco Corleone. If you tap, type in Marco Corleone, you'll find a bunch of my like wrestling. Uh, uh, you'll you'll find it. If you just type my name, you'll find a ton of videos. What's a good me one in Mexico? Are there, I don't know how their footage is. Was a lot of it recorded and put out there? or I put it mostly out. So you if you just go to my okay. social media, you'll see. I, I'm always tooting my own horn, putting okay. these little videos, these crazy videos together. So Plug your social media real quick. Um, you know what? I don't, and, uh, my my, my um, Instagram, I believe it's at Marco Corleone 23. Okay. Um, and I think... My my Facebook is Mark R Jindrak and my Twitter handle I think is Jindrak one okay. at Jindrak one. I'm, I don't you know one like, of those. If you just, Mark, if, if, Mark Jindrak. Uh, Mark Jindrak. Then you'll, you'll see. I'm verified on all these on these sites. So here we go. Awesome, Mark. Way well, I appreciate you, man, coming on here today, talking oh, about you. your journey, man. It's been fun getting to meet you, and uh, thank you guys for watching. Like, subscribe, and we will see you next time. Peace. <laughs>